All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for giving us some of your time today. Uh, as, the, as advertised, we're going to be discussing the exciting topic of digital transformation and cover some tried and true techniques that GE has performed on itself as we continue to disrupt ourselves. And then in turn, what we do with our customers, which is essentially the transformation playbook. Um, as everyone knows, when it comes to transformation, putting together a sustainable, measurable, multi-year plan, it's, uh, it's really hard to know where to start. And that's exactly what we're going to address today, how to get started, how to map out a detailed roadmap that makes economic sense for your business. Okay. So this webinar is going to be 45 minutes long. We'll have about 35 minutes of content and then 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. The webinar is a listen only, and that means you can hear us, but we can't hear you. But that does not mean it's not going to be interactive, um, as we're going to have Q&A uh, Q at the end. You can type your questions at any time into the Q&A window that you see on your screen. If you don't see the Q&A window, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon at the very bottom of your screen. It's the last icon on the right. Um, so going over the agenda real quick. Uh, we will cover the transformation playbook that's known as the digital transformation blueprint. Uh, we will go over what is included uh, in terms of deliverables, then timelines and necessary internal resources to success successfully execute one of these. Uh, and then we'll get into questions. So we're, uh, we're really lucky to get two great guests and subject matter experts for you today and Paul Casco and Mark Gurley. Just a quick bio because I want to make sure we jump right into content as we have limited time. Uh, Paul is currently running GE Digital's Digital Transformation Blueprint Center of Excellence, where he and his team partner with enterprise clients on really paving the path and executing transformation. Uh, Paul came to us via the Meridium acquisition, where he was VP of Consulting and head of the Meridium Institute and APM industry principal. Um, He's a leading practitioner in reliability and maintenance improvement methodologies. And Paul holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from West Virginia University, a master's in engineering management from University, uh, Marshall University, and an MBA from Clemson University, as well as a master's in management, uh, maintenance management and reliability engineering um, from Monash University. Uh, and uh, his counterpart, Mark Gurley, is another one of our key leaders within GE Digital's Digital Transformation Blueprint Center of Excellence. Uh, Mark also focuses on the digital transformation blueprinting process that really, again, helps our clients successfully transition into digital industrial organizations. Uh, Mark has spent the last 10 years consulting, implementing, and designing solutions for a variety of industrial verticals. And he's a certified reliability engineer through ASQ, as well as maintaining a certified maintenance, maintenance and reliability professional certification through SMRP and an API 580 risk-based inspection certification through the American Petroleum Institute. So some, some fantastic folks with us today. So um, at this point, I wanna jump right in and, and pass the ball to Mark Gurley, who's gonna be taking us through some of this content for the next 35 minutes. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Cody, and uh, good morning, evening, and afternoon to everyone online. So when we really think about uh, a digital transformation blueprint, um, what we're really talking about is how to build that plan that is going to take your organization through digital transformation. So we like to think of this as the front end engineering design phase of a what is typically a multi-year uh, initiative that can actually have a lot of fronts to it um, from reliability standpoint, maintenance standpoint, um, and simple culture change within your organization. So this is, a, this is hard work. Uh, a lot of companies have tried to do this for many years. As Cody mentioned, GE uh, started doing this process uh, several years ago, and we've, we've already seen great success and we've learned a ton. So that's what we're trying to bring to the marketplace uh, with our clients. But what we're really going to do is uh, build this this roadmap, if you will, to understand how are we going to get uh, from here to there. And like any roadmap, we really have to have a few key um, takeaways. First, where are we today? Where are we in our organization um, and within our industry vertical and within the, the areas that we operate in? Um, but then also, 
uh, where do we want to go? What's that target area? Uh, what's that target maturity level in the future? And of course, it's going to take uh, effort to get there. It's going to take resources from your side. It's going to take uh, both financial and human resources. So we have to understand what's the benefit of making these changes. No one wants to change their organization just for change sake. So we really need to dig in and understand what are the key business objectives that will be met? Uh, why does this matter to the organization? What's the financial impact and the financial payback um, for these types of changes? And then lastly, we have to have a, a, a detailed action plan. It's, it's really great to know that we want to improve, but we need to understand what exact activities are we going to be performing uh, to achieve these objectives. And that's where the, the uh, multi-generational plan and the implementation plan come in, as you'll see. So we've really looked at um, the digital transformation and the blueprint itself is, has a wide variety of applications and it's, um, it's quite complex in certain areas, but a few things stand out. One is because this is a blueprint, uh, because this is a kind of the roadmap and the, the, the path forward, it makes sense that we want to implement this uh, near the beginning of our journey. So we want to design this um, this digital transformation blueprint and the processes that go along with it uh, at the front end of these big initiatives. Um, when we're designing the solutions, we're designing work processes for your end users to adopt that sort of thing. So we really try to keep this on the front end, um, but we can really implement this at any time in your in your um, in your journey because these things also have a, a really heavy impact when we're revitalizing um, some organizations' digital journeys going forward. The other thing I want to point out too, there's, there's going to be a, a wide variety of you on the phone uh, and are attending this webinar from a wide variety of verticals uh, in our industries. So this is not uh, an industry specific type of methodology. We, we perform digital transformation blueprints for uh, a wide variety of industry verticals, power and generation, uh, chemical production, oil and gas refining, uh, transportation, uh, aviation, a, a whole wide range of it. So this is a, an agnostic methodology that really applies to any industry and any industry vertical. Now, like I said, there are a lot of elements to the digital transformation blueprint. We've kind of broken this down into six main elements that we'd like to talk about uh, with our clients. And we'll go over a, a brief overview of each one of these as we go forward. So the first element that we really want to talk about is what we call outcome quantification. Um, outcome quantification really starts with the idea of something called an outcome map. Uh, and you can think of this as a, a bit more detailed discussion and um, evaluation of what your business objectives are and what can be done at a high level to adopt, to uh, see the value in those business objectives. So everyone wants to just say, you know, we want to improve availability or we want to decrease our maintenance costs, but that's a pretty wide um, uh, business objective. We, we want to get a little bit more detail and understand how can we actually improve our availability? What is, what's limiting our availability now? What are some of the levers that uh, can be used to, um, to affect those, uh, that availability number or the maintenance number, et cetera? So we want to start with, a, with an outcome map already identified. And within the digital transformation blueprinting process, we want to dig in deeper and really understand what are the values associated with those different levers and with and with the required capabilities that that will move those levers so this is putting that financial model around um, if we go to improve if we move forward what's the value to my organization and there's a lot of ways we can look at this um, we typically look at it in as most simplistic terms as is practical so how much availability increases do we expect over the course of several years? Uh, what kind of maintenance efficiencies can be gained and why, et cetera? So we look at typically a five-year window. Uh, these are not uh, simple, you know, three-month projects that um, that are a one-and-done 
type of uh, engagement. These are ongoing, uh, continuously improving type of initiatives. So uh, we really look to put some value behind this and then look for the long term in terms of the financial benefit. Now, next, we want to take a look at what we call the industrial transformation readiness. And this gives us a, a really good in-depth understanding of where your organization is at from a capability standpoint, both in terms of uh, your human resource capability, your end users, your, your shop floor people, as well as leadership, but also things like, you know, what tools are you using? What uh, systems do you have in place? What work process do you have in place? Things like that. So we have a maturity model that's been developed um, for many years and continues to be improved and honed and uh, made more and more relevant for specific uh, industry verticals uh, that looks at a 30-element a approach to how an organization runs its business. Again, everything from uh, what kind of uh, what kind of tools are used up to what kind of incentives are put in place for production leaders versus maintenance folks versus reliability folks, that sort of thing. And so we rate everything on a one to four scale, one being uh, completely reactive and inefficient, all the way up to a what we would consider a liability driven kind of world class uh, maturity level. And based on what we understand of your organization and your facilities, we'll actually go and look at where are you at in terms of this maturity model and in terms of all of these separate elements that roll up you know, to a higher level. And then more importantly, where could you be? And this is done cooperatively with our clients in the DTD process where we understand if we put together certain uh, initiatives and we put certain work processes and tools, what kind of adjustment could we make on those maturity levels? And that adjustment, you know, is aligned to value and it's aligned to that financial model that we talked about. The other thing we want to do too is understand where you're at in terms of a lot of your data and your benchmarking capabilities. Because what we hear from a lot of clients in a wide variety of industries is they have a uh, a, a distinct lack of data or lack of good uh, in integrity of their data. And so we have a process and a product called Asset Answers that looks at not only where do you stack up um, against peers in your same industry group or your same vertical, but even internally, uh, how, is, how good is your data or more importantly, how bad is your data? Is it really that bad? Are there gaps? And we can make some really great insights into um, the data that you're gathering now, what what uh, effect it has in your organization, where do you rank based on a very industry well-known standard uh, KPIs and metrics, and then we can begin to dig into those data gaps accordingly. So this, this really helps us understand going forward, how would we implement and how would we approach the digital transformation? Because even putting together the exact same um, set of solutions might differ slightly on a less mature client or less mature um, workforce than it would in a client or workforce that you know has these has these systems in place and just needs a little honing and help. So that leads us into the next uh, area of called solution alignment, where we really dig into what kind of um, actual solutions are going to support this approach to these business objectives. And think of this uh, not just in terms of software tools. We're, we're not just talking about uh, better databases and, and better uh, integration and, and better user interfaces, but this is also the work processes that your end users will utilize um, that are supported by these tools. So it, you can have the best tool in the world um, in terms of software application but if there's no consistent process by which your entire workforce utilizes that tool, then you're only going to see limited values. And so we want to make sure that those, um, those work processes are really well aligned to, uh, first of all, how you're doing business today if it's um, required in that way. So if we talk about, you know, some specific regulatory compliance issues or, um, you know, some geographical or business-related um, restrictions on how you have to do certain things, 
we want to make sure that your workforce has a very well documented um, and very uh, concise work process that we can roll out to their different facilities. And what we've seen is if you concentrate on the work process that a, that a, uh, a, a workforce is utilizing and simply look at the tools as supporting elements of that work process, the, um, the retention rate that we see with end users actually utilizing those tools effectively and efficiently uh, and to their utmost it, it is greatly increased. If you just give a workforce um, a set of tools and a, a, a manual to read it, then you know, you're gonna be struggling to really get adoption uh, through all the different departments. We also wanna make sure that these work processes, again, line back to those outcome uh, quantification steps and the, uh, the outcome mapping. So we don't wanna put uh, undue burden on the end user and on your employees that don't really align directly to a business objective. We're very sensitive to that. And then obviously if we're putting a lot of these um, work processes that are being supported by these, you know, cutting edge digital tools, we need to understand uh, a little bit about your technical architecture in terms of, you know, things around uh, what kind of data systems do you currently have? We, uh, everyone on the phone call can probably relate to the large amount of um, disparate systems that can be found in a lot of our organizations. Uh, there's access databases everywhere. There are, um, you know, the, the uh, quintessential spreadsheet that everyone goes to as the source of truth that's kept on somebody's uh, uh, personal computer or you know, maybe in a, uh, a shared directory, but if something happens to that spreadsheet, it causes an un untold disaster in, in a department. So we want to really suss out all of these different areas, all the way from the, the small little personal spreadsheet, all the way up to enterprise level tools like uh, SAP, Maximo, Oracle, that sort of thing, and understand how are these, these tools and how are all of these systems going to play a part in the future 2B state. So we want to look at all of that. We'll talk with your IT staff and understand how you deploy software, uh, connectivity for you know, some facilities that may be kind of off the beaten path, that sort of thing. And we'll try to um, align as best as possible on how we would come in and actually integrate into this system uh, or improve it, et cetera. So that's a, it's a pretty hefty part of the DTB in terms of the technical kind of bits and bytes section. Now, once we know all of that, once we have kind of all of this set in motion, what we really want to do is start focusing on the plan itself for how are we going to move forward. Um, and this really has two components. So one would be uh, what we would call like the initial uh, scope. So this is, you know, after this meeting, what are we going to do first? Um, what facility are we going to visit for the first time? Uh, if, if a lot of our clients obviously have multiple facilities globally. Do we want to implement one at a time? Do we want to implement um, all at once for certain applications or certain work processes, et cetera? So all of this is kind of agreed upon and understood. And then we put a plan together for what's the next step? What are the action sequences there? But one thing that we don't want to look, we don't want to lose sight of is what comes after the initial step. So we call this the multi-generational plan or multi-generational roadmap, where we're really looking at, um, you know, what are the next phases of growth in this initiative? And it could be just what I mentioned earlier about a rollout schedule. It could be, we're going to take uh, the, the work processes that we have vetted and put in place at facility one, and we're going to roll those out over 20 other facilities on a global scale, and we're going to build a plan for that as part of our multi-generational roadmap. It could also be a widening of that net. So uh, we have a lot of clients that will uh, inherently benefit from a lot of the work processes that we've been doing for years um, and a lot of the different solutions that we offer. Yet most of our clients, you know, they're just unable to consume all of that um, at one time. There has to be a, a bit of a, a process to, you know, bite one bite at a time to eat the elephant. So 
we try to lay out what is the highest um, priority and what's the highest value and payback for rolling this stuff out. And that way we can take a look at um, doing portions of it as, as part of a multi-generational roadmap. So we really want to not lose focus of what comes in year two, year three, year four, um, and, and just you know get tunnel vision on the first year because we always want to be looking ahead. So that's part of our multi-generational roadmap. And then along with that, along with the multi-generational roadmap and the um, the uh, you know the next steps, the short-term plan, we put together what's called an outcome realization plan. And we've done this um, over the years for a couple of different reasons. But mainly, we want to see success, obviously, in our clients. And part of the reason that some uh, software implementations aren't as successful as others or the value hasn't been gained is sometimes this seems, it, it seems a little um, counterintuitive, but sometimes we don't really understand what the goal of success is or what the definition of success is. So we really want to put together a plan that emphasizes exactly where we should be uh, in terms of the, of the uh, multi-generational roadmap or in terms of the uh, implementation plan. So we wanna see what are the critical success factors? What are the uh, KPIs? How would we track whether or not we are, we are uh, uh, on the right path to achieving those, those KPIs and to hitting the targets that we all said was possible? Uh, we also want to understand what are the risks to a plan. So we've all been in projects at, of one type or another. You know, projects are only as good, uh, you know, plans are only as good until the first, uh, the first activity is done, right? So things change, priorities change, business objectives change, uh, business conditions in the world change. This is, this is unavoidable. But we need to understand when we're doing a project that can span 18 months potentially if we get to month three and we change a significant part of the plan we need to understand how that's going to affect us either positively or negatively so we like to do what's called a risk mitigation analysis and what we're really trying to understand is what are the items that we have seen over the past decades in doing these types of implementations that really affect a customer's um, you know, value proposition. So, in, in, and what we'll do is we'll work with your team, we'll um, understand what are the top three or four you know, heavy contributors to a uh, negative impact on value. And then we'll make sure we have a very clear defined plan uh, to understand you know, how are we going to mitigate the risks to those things actually happening. And this could be, Things like just shifting allocations of budgets away from training to, um, you know, we had planned on five people being dedicated to a rollout schedule, and now we only have two people available to us. Well, how does that affect us going forward? Things of that nature. So that'll be part of this discussion, too, and understanding, uh, you know, what, what do we need to do to really make this a success? The other part of this is what we call a governance plan, and this is, this is kind of, if you want to think of it, the communication strategy between GE and our customers and clients. Um, a lot of these initiatives have a ton of people involved, but some from very different departments, very different backgrounds, very different objectives, and they may come and go as the implementation plan uh, dictates. It may not be somebody that's in there the entire time or the entire duration. So we want to make sure that we have a very clear communication strategy between the, our, our clients, project teams, and stakeholders, and the appropriate number of people in GV and the appropriate level. So we are very transparent. We have a very clear escalation uh, path in terms of uh, how we handle issues and concerns and overcome them. So all of that is part of this outcome realization plan where we really want to dig into what do we need to do to make this to make this a success. So it seems like there's a lot going on in the digital transformation blueprint, and you would not be wrong in saying that. There's there's a ton of stuff that happens in this, uh, and we have a ton of people behind the scenes as well as 
on site that really work hard to make this possible. But one of the things that we're very sensitive of is we do not want this to turn into a, an endless um, analysis of, of uh, you know, where we need to go. We actually want some actions to happen. So we try to make this as precise and tactical as is practical. So when we're talking about the timeline of how to execute one of these, how much time do we spend on site with people, how much time do we spend off site, et cetera, we really try to focus in and make it and limit it to limit it, it to about four to six weeks from beginning to end, where we give the client a um, you know at least a final draft of what the outcomes are, what the, what the project plan is, uh, what the uh, the uh, ITR results are, all of that stuff. So what we typically do is spend about a week or so. Um, once the project has been greenlit and approved, to do some pre-planning. So we'll request some information from your organization. We'll give you some information uh, to prepare your group. We'll talk about schedules, agendas, uh, personas, who we want to talk to at the facility, um, what our approach is going to be, all of that stuff. So we'll, we'll do some pre-planning. And then what we'll end up doing is coming on site to your facility and we'll usually spend three to five days on site. Uh, there will be a team from GE that does this. It's a multidisciplinary team uh, comprised of uh, you know, management and leadership as well as subject matter experts, technical experts, et cetera. Uh, the team composition shifts obviously depending on what the scenario dictates and what industry we're in um, and how complex the, the project is gonna be. But typically, there is that same set of SMEs, management, and technical. And we'll spend about, like I said, three to five days um, going through everything from maturity assessments to really digging deep into the solution alignment and understanding um, how your systems work currently versus how we would want them to work in the future from a work process standpoint. Uh, and then start looking at the outcome realization planning, prioritization of rollouts, things of that nature. Uh, and then we take that information off-site and we look at um, putting together the business case and financial model. So we're looking at the values and opportunities that we've identified, uh, what are the impacts of a you know, X percent increase in availability, what are the impacts of an X percent decrease in maintenance costs, that sort of thing, and where is that going to come from. So we'll start putting together that, uh, that model. and. This off-site activity is, is very collaborative with the clients. This is not something that uh, the GE team will come on site, take a bunch of notes, and then leave and give you a, a report in a few weeks. We are in um, deep and constant conversation and uh, collaboration with our clients' teams because at the end of the day, this is a, a joint initiative between GE and our clients. This is not just a, a black box. Um, proposal that we get from us. So we'll spend a couple of weeks after the on-site engagement putting all of this stuff together, uh, putting all of our findings in, documenting the uh, proposed path forward, documenting why are we going in this direction, all of that sort of thing. And we'll also be developing the actual implementation plan for this first stage of implementation activities. So as part of the deliverable that uh, our clients get from this activity, you'll get not only a digital transformation blueprint uh, report and um, uh, you know, assessment in general, but you also get this supporting initiative plan that we think is the best uh, path forward for you for the immediate start. And this again is done in cooperation and collaboration with you and your team. So there'll be direct alignment by the time we get through with this. And then what we like to do after that is when we're finalized in terms of uh, the implementation approach, um, the report kind of details and statistics, then we want to go come back on site um, and, and present this to your leadership and make sure every all the appropriate stakeholders at all levels of your leadership are aware and understand kind of what we did, why we did it in the digital transformation blueprinting, 
and also what are the next steps and why are they valuable to the organization. So, you know, we want to help your teams internally move this up the ladder and make sure everyone understands why these are important initiatives to put on the table and get action behind. So, again, some of these vary. Uh, not every, uh, by nature, none of these are done exactly the same because none of your organizations are the exact same. So they vary, but in general, they're four to six weeks. Um, if we have to do multiple facilities, that could take a little bit longer. Uh, if we're doing, um, you know, just highly, highly complex type of uh, uh, integration and initiatives, it might take a little bit longer. But we've seen pretty good success in turning these around in this time frame. So it's not too much, too far off. And then, like I said, um, the people who participate in some of these these DTVs, again, is a, it, we have a very wide variety of disciplines and expertise within GE and GE Digital. So we're looking at, when we talk about professional services, we have subject matter experts in, you know, just about every industry that you can think of and certainly every industry that we serve. So if we're going to be talking with a manufacturing facility, then, you know, we won't bring somebody who's an expert in oil and gas exploration drilling, right, and vice versa. So we will make sure we understand exactly who we need to have on site, who we need to have supporting our team's back office, and then we'll coordinate that from a higher level um, to be consistent in our approach of the, of the uh, digital transformation methodology. So we'll have all of that lined up. Uh, we'll also have uh, behind us um, supporting people like the education department that help us determine the training plan and the education rollout for our clients because this is a huge part of any kind of adoption for new work processes is making sure that the end users, the people who are going to be benefiting directly from this, um, really understand how to use it correctly. And then we'll have representatives from customer engagement and customer success um, that really carry forward the torch of success and uh, the outcome realization plan. Obviously, our sales uh, organization will be part of this and uh, support us and then technical support along the way and, and obviously after as well. So you can see this isn't just a couple of people coming out. Um, the team sizes vary, but it can be anywhere from five or six people to upwards of, you know, a dozen, depending on how uh, complex and complicated the situation is. So I know that was a, a lightning overview of the digital transformation blueprint, but we just want to give you guys a taste of it and understand some of the activities that go into this. So I think we have time now for some questions. If we want to uh, get some questions off of the, the webinar, Cody. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So, um, so Mark, we got a ton of questions that came in, which is great. Um, one of the first ones I'd like to kick off with, and then, you know, as we can move through these as quickly as we can, because we do have a bunch, um, but definitely want to get them answered. Number one, sounds like a great process. Can you give me an example of a customer that went through this and explain where they were from a maturity standpoint, and then what benefits they, they realized from going through this? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, we've done, we've been doing this type of engagement for um, well over 10 years now, obviously not under the GE digital banner, but we've been doing this for a long time. And one of our latest ones um, that we did was for Afton Chemical, and we actually have some information coming out not too far in the future uh, where Afton was kind enough to um, share an interview with us on you know, share some of their internal thoughts on why they chose to, to pursue this process and uh, some of the benefits. So keep your eye out for that. But essentially what they were looking at doing, they're a, a smaller company, but global. They have uh, facilities in uh, America and uh, Europe and in Asia. And they were really looking to kind of step up and take a, a higher look at efficiency and globalization to stay on the edge of their market. Um, they do specialty chemicals and additives, and they, they needed some help. They needed a plan. They knew they had a lot of opportunity, 
Um, they had a lot of efficiencies that they could improve, but they weren't exactly sure how to get going and start from a global initiative standpoint. So uh, we worked with them in this regard. We went through and, and had great support from their uh, executive leadership. Um, and we made changes, you know, obviously with their, um, with their buy-in, but they, they now have a, um, a more of a global view of sharing stories. They have uh, steering committees now for reliability and maintenance. Uh, and they have already started to see some benefits through this, uh, through implementation of, in their case, it was asset performance management that they were implementing. Uh, but they're well on their way to uh, implementing that at their global facility. So for them, it was not only the end result of, of the APM initiative, but the DTB and that process really brought to light um, some opportunities they could do from a culture standpoint and just internal communication. So they saw great benefit in that. There's more to come, too, when they uh, put out the official press release. Fantastic. Okay. And then Mark and Paul, uh, if we have multiple facilities, do we have to execute a, a DTB at each one, or is there more of a, a holistic strategy? Paul, I'll let you take that one. Well, um, there are a couple of strategies for this. First, you might consider building a corporate strategy where we're going to standardize these processes that Mark talked about and roll them out uh, across the company. But many times we have customers who have plants which may be similar, but there are some differences. Uh, and we'll start out at, at a plant, uh, develop these processes with the customers, and then do a much shorter version uh, at other plants. And then the, sort of the third version of this is we have uh, customers who have uh, different operating divisions, which are really, uh, really radically different in what they make and what they do. And in those cases, uh, we typically would do uh, uh, more than one for those divisions. But let's say you're a power company, you have 20 plants around the world, you wouldn't need to do this 20 times. You you might group your plants and, and uh, do it once or twice and, and uh, the, the main objective is to try to standardize as much as you can across the company because it certainly gives you flexibility with your people, flexibility with your processes, and the tools that you use. Perfect. And Paul and Mark, how many people will I need to dedicate from the client side? So what's, what's the commitment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good question. So as in most things, it depends a little bit. Um, but typically we, you know, we're, again, very sensitive to the, the time that we take away from your organization because uh, I have yet, in, in my years of implementation and consulting, I have yet to uh, work with a, a customer who has people just on standby and idle. So everyone is busy. Everyone's typically overloaded, if not, if not, uh, anything less. So we, we try really hard to be very strategic and very surgical in our nature of requesting people's time. That being said, we typically like to have um, at least one dedicated person to be the contact point, the client sponsor, if you will, um, that you can think of as the coordinator, organizer, uh, manager for the client side. So they're, they're going to take the brunt of the work during the DTB process itself. Um, but then after that, it's really on an as-needed basis. We work with that team to understand um, when and who we need to interact with. And it is a wide variety of groups. So we may talk to, in some cases, 20 people at a facility. In some cases, it's only five. And in some cases, it's double that. Um, but that doesn't mean that those people are going to be involved for four to six weeks. Even on the on-site portion, you know, we're talking hours that we need to really interact with these different folks. So um, I would say from a full-time equivalent, it's probably one or two people, to be honest, um, because we are going to be just tapping one person, then another person, and another person as needed. But we at all times uh, are, are really sensitive to taking up people's time and, and making it as efficient as possible. 
Uh, and what what I think you may have mentioned this, Mark, but um, what you know, what verticals does this apply to? Uh, are you guys really you know, can you can you handle most of the industrial verticals, or is there a sweet spot? Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, good question. So we, you know, the the example I used today was uh, asset performance management within the chemicals industry, but uh, that's just an example. We have uh, th this process is applicable really to all industries that GE operates in, which, as we all know, are pretty much all industries to some some extent or another. Uh, the process will be the same. The methodology, the outlined uh, steps that I went through will be very similar, whether we are discussing aviation industry or downhole drilling in the oil and gas industry. Now, what may change are things, the content, right? So some of the things that we talked about around maturity modeling, the maturity model for um, a GE healthcare client might look a lot different than the maturity model for a discrete manufacturing client. And we've made those changes. So we have maturity models that are tweaked for those very specific um, industries. But the, the methodology remains the same. We're still going to want to understand outcomes and business objectives and then uh, associate financial impacts to those and why do we care? So what's the value in it? Um, all, all the rest is really the same, and it's applicable to all these other industries. So we've done this in manufacturing. We've done it in transportation, um, in uh, obviously oil and gas, chemical, mining. We, we've done it in just a wide variety of different industries. And I would add that uh, also a wide variety of solution sets, uh, such as brilliant manufacturing, uh, uh, service max, uh, AP and grid, uh, the grid solution. So uh, this is not just an APM only process. So it's, uh, it's as Mark said, uh, sort of industry agnostic, but also it has a, a wide variety of solution sets that we can uh, address. Perfect. And we've got a, a specific question. Um, could you share some sources of information and references for building industry digitalization and I'll I'll take that and then you know Mark and Paul if you guys want to jump in so if you guys go to ge.com slash digital um, we have a ton of information there if, if you're specifically interested in the in the digital transformation blueprint element and and some of the, the success stories that we've done and worked with customers go under the, the services portion under the nav um, specifically into advisory services um, and that that should give you definitely a you know good amount of information and kind of a repository of, of what we've done and some good examples. Uh, Paul, Mark, I don't know if there's anything else that comes to mind just in terms of good information as folks think about um, industry digitalization. Well, I, I would say after, I think you, you gave them the, the best head start, and after a few weeks of reading uh, everything that's on that, that site, if there's still some more or some very specific questions, you know, I think the best thing is to reach out directly either to your representative or to us and, and we can have that dialogue. Okay, great. And, and then we've got, you know, a question around, around cost, you know, what are, what's the associated size slash cost? Yeah, good question. And, you know, uh, back to, to my consulting answer of it depends, right? So th these things um, are a probably 80% fit out of the box. We have a, we have a process uh, with a scope of work, deliverables, et cetera, that we have honed over many years in doing this. Uh, but again, by design, you know, the, these things are different for every client. Um, because they are tailored specifically to your situation. So there's going to be some, some contributing factors on cost. Everything from uh, what size facility are we talking about? Uh, what, um, what solution set are we talking about even being applicable? You know, is this brilliant manufacturing? Is it APM? Is it cybersecurity? Is it all three of them, um, which is the case sometimes? Um, and then also, you know, is it, are you a multi-facility uh, or 
organization, which you know a lot of them, uh, you know, a lot of organizations now these days are global in nature. And so we need to take into account: uh, is this going to be a one facility type of uh, engagement, or do we need to have a European version, an Asia Pac version, an American version? So, you know, unfortunately, there is no one uh, answer to it. The best the best thing to say is it's a case-by-case -case basis, and we can get you an answer very quickly um, just through some, some very quick preliminary discussion. But the, the best way to move forward with that is to reach out to the, the email you see on your screen or your sales representative. Okay, fantastic. Well, look, folks, appreciate your time today. Like we're running out of, uh, out of time for the webinar. Again, any additional questions, contact your, your GE sales rep. Also, uh, feel free to email dtv.services at ge.com. And then again, more information, you can go to ge.com slash services, and then just go to the services nav, uh, nav under um, advisory services. So Paul and Mark, really appreciate you guys spending some time today. And, um, and listeners, thanks for, for joining us for this webinar.